Okay, just if you haven't gotten the book, I just want to put my cards on the table. I think it's as moving and as exquisite a memoir as I've read in my memory, wow. in all sincerity. And doing being a sports writer, I read a lot of memoirs. And it, it's not just a terrific memoir. It's a memoir you're going to want to give as a gift to other people, particularly young people who you feel like have potential but may possibly lose their way. And I, I've never read anything that speaks to that person, you know, that person with intellectual, not necessarily athletic, not necessarily musical, but intellectual gifts who could very easily fall by the wayside. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thank accomplishment. You. So thank you. It's a, it's a book that will keep giving. But... It does lead to this question, though, because you're, you're not an old man. You're, I wouldn't even call you middle-aged. That would be even impolite. So I ask you this. <laughs> why a memoir at this point in your life? Why did you choose to write a memoir now? Well, um, first of all, let me just say um, all praise is due to God, and I'm just really thankful uh, to God for any opportunity that I have. Um, I'm just thankful, and I'm happy to be here, and I was, I'm very happy to see people here because you could be somewhere else, so I appreciate you all being here. Uh, I also want to shout out Deborah Schwartz and Marsha Eli and the Brooklyn Historical Society, Caitlin, everyone here. I really appreciate them a, a great deal uh, for giving us this space, and, and I want to shout out Dave, uh, who I do believe is the finest sports writer we have in the country. Uh, started reading his work. Oh, yeah. Just I started reading his work uh, years ago, and I was just really struck, even if you're not a sports fan, the way he intersects race and gender and class and economics into sports. And so I immediately knew when I started reading his work before I met him that we were uh, yeah. brothers. But not, not my night, Kevin. I, but I, okay. I still have to say that, <laughs> you know, because um, I believe in uh, sharing with people, you know what I'm Thank saying, and, and giving props where they're due. Thank you. Um, I don't even know where to start. It's good to be in Brooklyn, where I live, you know what I'm saying? Um, all 12 of my books pretty much have been written in Brooklyn, even though I'm born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, I, oh yeah, Jersey, shout out to Jersey City, Hudson County. Um, I've been through a lot in my life, you know. Um, you know, it's interesting you asked the question because uh, Kendrick Lamar, Long before he became Kendrick Lamar, I was listening to him, and I just, you know, there's it, been a lot of rappers that have moved me since Tupac and Biggie, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, um, as I was writing this book, I was listening to Kendrick, I was listening to Lupe, I was listening to Pac, Jigga, you know, different people. I was listening to Billie Holiday, listening to John Lennon, listening to Bob Marley. Um, I decided to write it because I just felt like, you know, I don't know how much time I'm going to have on this planet, you know, regardless of how old I am or how young I am. Uh, and I wish that some of the things that I said in the book uh, would have been said in some of the books that I read coming up. Mm. You know, my favorite book is Autobiography of Malcolm X, which still is the most important thing I've ever read in my life. It was transformative when I read it at 18 years of age. You know, um, I was touched by that book. I've been touched by... Uh, down these mean streets by the great, the late great Latino writer Perry Thomas. You know, um, I read Frank McCourt's Angela, Angela Ashes, the late great Irish American writer, it had a profound effect on me. Um, and I just, I just felt like you know, in our generation or our generations, people who grew up in the hip hop era, you know, it, we need to start telling our stories. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I felt like there was enough there at this stage, given what I've experienced, especially the, the highs and lows you know, um, of, of my life, you know, uh, growing up with a single mother, absent father, growing up poor, welfare and food stamps and uh, some of the worst living conditions, you know, that you can imagine. Uh, but having this thing called education that my mother pushed really saving my life and her taking me to the library when I was a kid at eight years of age and the library becoming a central safe space for me, you know what I mean? Uh, all the trauma that I experienced, the violence that I experienced that became violence of my own violence towards other people when I got older, the anger. Um, you know, and I speak a lot like you do, Dave, around the country, and I realized that I have been telling bits and pieces of my story for the last 15 years or so, 20 years or so, and I just felt like I needed to put it in one place. It's been in speeches, it's been in poems, as you know, Deborah alluded to, it's been in uh, essays, what we call blogs now. And so I decided to put it in a book, and it, it was the hardest thing I have ever written in my life, harder than the previous 11 books combined. Mm. Yeah. Well, and one of the things about it that's so powerful is, I mean, you write about 
poverty yeah. in a way that's very visceral. If anybody's taking a creative writing class, you know the first thing they say is show, don't tell. Yeah. And this book shows poverty more than it tells it. And you don't have a lot of journalism about poverty in this country for reasons that are structural. Yeah. Because nobody's trying to pay anybody to write about the lives of how the majority of people actually have to live in yeah. this country. Yeah. And uh, I want, was that conscious in your head that I am going to tell a story of what it means to see rats as part of your life, to yeah. see vermin, to not know where your next meal is coming from so people maybe who haven't experienced that can feel the sting and people who have know that it is possible to move away from it? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I feel blessed because I'm a, I'm a professional now. I, I, I'm middle class, but I'll never forget where I come from. You know what I mean? And, you know, as I've traveled this country and I've pretty much been to all 50 states, I've met poor white people, poor black people, poor Latino people, poor Asian people. You know, I've listened to the stories of sisters and brothers who are Jewish, who've talked about the Holocaust, I've talked about what they've experienced. I've listened to people who, talk to, who were Italian American talk about their experiences. You, talk, you listen to Puerto Ricans and Dominicans talk about their experiences. You know, and I just feel like uh, as we're about to celebrate Dr. King's birthday this weekend, what we get caught up on is this whole I have a dream speech, which is a tremendously revolutionary speech if you actually read it. But what's ignored is that this man who was born into the black elite, who was a part of the black upper class in Atlanta, Georgia, who got his high school diploma at 16, his PhD by 24, 25, Nobel Peace Prize winner by 34. He was dead by 39, but the last thing he was doing was organizing a poor people's campaign because Dr. King understood instinctively that there's economic injustice in this country. And what I realized, Brother Dave, as I was coming of age, is that I'm one of the people that Dr. Ting King was talking about, because mm -hmm. I was born in the late 1960s, and so I would have been part of that poor people's campaign. You know, poor people created this culture that I love called hip hop, poor African Americans, poor West Indians, and poor Latinos in New York City. And so, you know, which has become this multi-billion dollar global industry that's touched young people of all backgrounds around the country. But I feel like what's happened since the days of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy, another one of my heroes, is that we, we, we don't want to see poor people, we don't want to see poverty. Mm -hmm. Or we'll blame everything on poor people. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, I think about the Reagan years back in the 80s, and you still hear the same rhetoric now. My mother... Uh, is not a welfare queen. She was never a welfare queen. We needed welfare to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, we needed those food stamps to survive. And with her eighth grade education, she was actually the most intelligent and resourceful human being that I ever met, which is why the book is dedicated to her. And so I feel, I feel a tremendous responsibility uh, to be a voice for people where I come from, even though I may not live in the same environment anymore, but you never, never forget where you come from. Now, I'll just do this right here, but now you, you dedicate the book to your mother. Yeah. And for people who've read the book know this, your relationship with your mother as you write about it in the book is really marked by her, I read it as her attempting to treat you with a ferocious kind of love, but not even really knowing how to hug you at the same time. No, no. So, and it's something that people might even refer to as even abusive mm -hmm. in terms of like the absence of affection, yet not neglectful because she's always there. Yeah. It's an interesting thing, like always there doing her job as a mom, but also not willing to even reach out and give you that love. I mean, and his, um, Kevin's mom is still with us, and she read this book. No, she didn't read the book. Oh, she didn't read the book. She, I knew you talked to her about the book. She looked at the cover. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> That's as far as it got. I, I just, what, 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 what has your mother's response been to the publication of the book? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I see some folks from my, from my home community of Jersey City here. Uh, I had an, my, the first event we did, I wanted to do it in my hometown because, you know, I would not, I, I represent Brooklyn hard, y'all. You know what I'm saying, son? Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> I'm from Jersey City. Uh, uh, I'm from New Jersey, and that shaped me. And so we did our first event in Jersey in, in October, and then I immediately went to my mother's house with the book, and I said, Mom, I want you to, um, here's the book. And um, I asked her to read the dedication. It says to my mother, Shirley Powell, the first teacher and leader I ever met, which is the truth. You know, she is to this day. And if you read the book, or those who've read the book, from the first, the introduction right to the last line of the book, my mother is through the whole book. Because I begin to realize, and Eve Insler said this in her blurb of the book, that this book is as much about my mother as it is about me, you know. Um, um, she asked me, you didn't talk about the roaches in the book, did you? 
Mm. I say, well, you know, Ma, I did, but it's about how we overcame the roaches. Mm -hmm. You know, we overcame the roaches. She's like, we, you know, you know, and and I'm sure this this goes for every community, Jewish community, black community. Why you got to put our business out there? Well, it's about for me art because I'm an artist. It's about healing. You know what I mean? I'm, uh, you know, when you were asking about how I wrote the book. When I was a child, Dave I, and everyone, I wanted to be a fiction writer first. I, in high school, I loved uh, Shakespeare. I loved Edgar Allan Poe especially. Um, and, 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 and when I discovered black writers in college, I fell in love with Zora Neale Hurston and Richard Wright, people like that. And so I wanted to write something that really captured and made people feel like they were there. Um, abuse is an interesting term. The first interview I did uh, when the book came out, the, the journalist just said, your mother was abusive. And I took, I took pause with that. I said, no, my mother did the best that she could mm -hmm. under the circumstances. She was born in the 1940s in racist, segregated America. And she was born in the South. And as Malcolm X famously said, the South is south of the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Not just South Carolina, where she's from. And so what I, what I now say when people raise, raise the question, you know, about abuse. I said, well, my mother, as a, as a poor black woman, she was abused because of racism. She was abused because of sexism. She was abused because of classism. You know, there was no Oprah. There was no Yana Van Zandt. There was no counseling. There was no therapy. There was no healing circles. There were no sister circles. She simply had to suck it up and do the best that she could. And so I, this is why at, near the end of the book, I also talk about forgiveness and that this is a healing book. Because I think Jane Fonda, Y'all should look this up. She did a conversation in C on CNN.com a couple months ago. Her father, Henry Fonda, was the same way. No emotion, no affection. And she talked about how when he did his last film on Golden Pond, some of y'all remember the film, it was the first time they, she said she touched him in one scene and he had this visceral reaction. Jane Fonda said something that stuck with me. I had to evolve past my father. Appreciate, appreciate him for who he is. I had to evolve, brother past my mother. My mother gave me my work ethic. My mother gave me my learn love of reading. She, from the time I was three, four years old, I fell in love with reading because of my mother. Uh, she gave me a love of education. Uh, she's the reason why I have an imagination. My mother's the best storyteller I've ever met because she's, she, she's an oral historian. Every time I go to her house, I hear the same stories, but they're still fascinating to me. Mm. You know what I mean? But at some point, I realized, Kev, you got to learn how to say I love you. You got to learn how to hug. You got to learn how to touch people. You got to get past all this trauma and pain that was passed to you, uh, is passed literally from generation to generation, like a baton in a relay race. And this really goes for a lot of us out there. I don't know too many people, Brother Dave and everyone, who's not been wounded or traumatized in some way by someone in their family. You know, I was at an elite boarding school in uh, New England a couple months ago, 99% uh, white brothers. One man got up and he talked, he was 60 something years old, this white brother, he said, I realized my father, I'm not gonna use the word abuse, but he had passed all his pain to me, and here I am now in my 60s just realizing mm. what I've been carrying around. So I wanted to write a memoir that didn't just tell the story, but like, how do we, how do we heal, y'all? Mm -hmm. Without being preachy, you know, but how do we begin to heal, which is why the book is intentionally written in two parts. The first part is written like a novel, because I, you know, Great Expectations, Silas Marner, these are books that I loved as a child. But the second part of it, I said, I want to write in the spirit of Joan Didion and James Baldwin and Bell Hooks, where it's more autobiographical essay, because there's some things that we need to grapple with here. And so, you know, I love my mother. Um, it's still complicated. <laughs> because I never know what I'm going to get, but I have to make peace with the fact that I just have to strive to, to be different. And all I can say is thank God for yoga and therapy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and, you, and you ran the marathon, right? I ran, I've run, run two marathons now. I've gone back to running, which is a healing thing for me as well. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, re it really is, is staggering because it makes me, there's recent scientific study that shows that that kind of family trauma and pain actually gets passed down yeah. even through DNA. And so that old expression by Faulkner that the past is not even past. Ooh. It's like, how do we yeah. reckon, particularly in the black community, where we speak about slavery, where we speak about Jim Crow, segregation, Or, or the Jewish community talking about Holocaust. It's like, that's... Or, or I'll say this as a Jew right here, like the pain of knowing that there are people in my tribe who support the oppression of Palestinians. Wow. I mean, it's like, how do you, and that's, wow. a, that's a kind of pain as well. Wow. That's a kind of pain, because I forget, honest. 
I forget who, who said this. Um, I think it was actually Dr. King who said this about slavery and Jim Crow. It's like we talk about what it does to the black community, but how does it also warp the white community oh, yeah. that it is asked to maintain these systems of oppression? <laughs> so that warping takes place yeah. and then gets passed down, yeah. even if you are trying to do right and be as loving as possible and do everything right. So it's like how we break this stuff, at the very least it has to be conscious yeah. if we even have the capacity to break it at all. Well, you know, it's interesting because we do need to have conversations about systems of oppression, you know what I mean? And, you know, uh, the first half of the book goes into when I graduated from high school. I knew I was black. I knew I was black, but I didn't really know I was black. Between kindergarten and 12th grade, going to the so-called best public schools in Jersey City, black history might have totaled in those 13 years two pages, maybe. And you know what it was. Dr. King's Dream, Rosa Parks, Jackie Robinson, and Crispus Attucks. Remember him? Mm. First to die in the Revolutionary War, but black folks were still slaves. You know, and so when you talk about the warping, be it racism or sexism or classism or homophobia or disrespect for people's religion or disrespect for the disabled community, what I said yesterday, brother, and you talk about this in your work, and this is why your work is so important. Uh, I was at a high school in, in, in Long Island. If you don't see yourself in your education, you are being grossly miseducated. Your spirit is being warped. You're being taught to hate yourself. You know, you're being taught that you're inferior. I mean, what was interesting yesterday, let's think, deal with gender for a second. Uh, the, when I was speaking, I, I used the example, I started with racism, but I went to the example of gender. I said, man, my kindergarten through the 12th grade, same thing. I learned absolutely nothing about the contributions of women and girls on this planet. And you wonder why all these boys and men out here are misogynistic, patriarchal, sexist pigs. Mm. You know what I mean? And can I ask you about that, too? Because that was actually on my list of questions. Yeah. You, you probably have figured this out already, but it's very rare to hear Kevin Powell speak and invoke racism without then also saying the word sexism. And in academic parlance, that's called intersectionality, this idea that you don't look at oppression in a narrow vacuum. And I remember we had this conversation. I was interviewing you about a book I'm doing about, about Jim Brown, yeah. football player. And you spoke about how... It doesn't matter if you're speaking in a prison to a black and brown audience or to at a boarding school to a white audience. If there are men in that audience, you're always going to talk about sexism. Yeah. And first of all, applause to you because sometimes no. I could say as someone who's also well spoken in similar environments, like I've spoken in prisons before, and it's very easy to not do that for fear what the response will be, and because you're so desperate to connect with the audience. So I just want to, is that, we're talking about your mother, is that the legacy yeah. of your mother too and her experience that you feel an obligation? Like what, because it seems like you carry it as an obligation. Like I have to speak about these other issues. I can't just speak about racism in a vacuum. Well, I mean, and for those who have read the book or will read the book, um, I talk about when I was eight years old. I saw my father maybe three or four times up until uh, eight. They were never married and... Um, we didn't have a phone. We were so poor. We didn't have a phone. Uh, my mother and I shared a bed in the bedroom. My Aunt Kathy and my cousin Anthony shared a bed in the living room. I just want you all to think about that for a second. Two mothers and two sons in a one-bedroom apartment. Um, and my mother would periodically reach out to my father to see if he could help, you know. Um, this one day was raining, and we went to the corner drugstore where there was a pay phone. Remember those things, pay phones? <laughs> and, uh, um, she asked my father, can you help us? And I could see from her body language that my father was saying what she would repeat to me later. You lied to me. You know, he's not my son. I'm not going to give you a near nickel for him ever again. And hung up the phone on my mother. And my mother, I could see her being deflated by it. You know, and even though my mother is, uh, you know, unfamiliar with the term feminism, basically, and the history of feminism or womanism, she clearly is because she, she, she understood, I mean, you know, y'all know, you know, I can do bad by myself. You know what I mean? That's a feminist anthem. I can, uh, don't be like your father. Look what he is. 
And unfortunately, Brother Dave, when I got to college, uh, I, I began to engage in the same destructive behavior that a lot of boys engage in on college campuses, because we're boys, we're not men. Uh, most of us never even are thinking about gender privilege, male privilege, et cetera. And I don't want to give away the book, but I end up doing some very destructive things to women, to women in my life, you know, at a certain point. And so I don't want to take credit for anything. I, the credit has to go to my mother because her voice has always been in my head, but also the women that I encountered when I started to begin to see that intersection between race and gender, you know, women from Spelman College, I got to shout them out, women from Sarah Lawrence College, women from uh, Vassar, uh, uh, Vassar College, women like Bell Hooks, who's a mentor, women like Gloria Steinem, Eve Enzer, women like that per uh, Pearl Klieg, you know, and so this is a process that's going on for 20 years, and the one thing that they said to me, which I, I took very seriously, and I still do, uh, uh, you know, you have to say something when you're in front of people. You know, you have to become an ally. Because a lot of men and boys, even if you've never been a batterer, never been an abuser, if you see this destructive behavior going on, fellas, and you say nothing about it, you become just as guilty. Mm. You know what I mean? And so I take that seriously. We can't just be opposed to oppression that's convenient for us. We got to be opposed to all forms of oppression. Now, I'll, I'll applaud that as well. You know, no one else has to. I'm just applauding it because I, <laughs> I feel that. But a part of the book that I deeply appreciated, and it, frankly, it's because of the generation I come from. I don't know if people older than us or younger than us would appreciate it, but I really appreciated that you spoke about hip hop activism, yeah. anti-racist activism in the late 80s, early 90s, Zulu Nation, Public Enemy, Sister Soldier, yeah. this whole period. Because when, especially when you read articles about Black Lives Matter, it's like from civil rights movement to Black Lives Matter, as if nothing happened for decades, <laughs> and as if nobody did anything yeah. for decades. So first of all, for folks who are there, because there are some young folks here, how would you encapsulate the movement and accomplishments mm. of the hip hop politics era of the late 80s, early 90s? I know I, I treat it like with reverence, because I feel like you guys broke the window of the Reagan years and let the air in. And yeah. for a lot of people like myself who weren't even aware that these ideas were out there, but as someone who was inside it, how do you measure the accomplishments, what you did, what you wish you'd done? It's crazy. So when I went to Rutgers in Jersey in the 1980s, I literally walked onto the campus into the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, I didn't know what apartheid was. I didn't know where South Africa was. Remember I said I knew nothing about black history, African history, Caribbean history. I, didn't, I knew nothing, you know. Uh, I didn't know who Nelson or Winnie Mandela were, Steve Biko. I didn't know what the ANC was, African National Congress, the Pan African Congress. I didn't know any of that stuff, um, but I was entranced by it, you know, because it was the first time I felt a connection to something, and I saw people, you know, young people of all colors, races, you know, doing it. But what was most important is I saw young people who looked like me, just like Black Lives Matter. Uh, the danger. I, I support Black Lives Matter. Let me say that very clearly. Oh yeah, and. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an activist for life, and I will always be an activist. This is my life work. The, the artist, art is cool, but without the activism, it's kind of empty to me, you know what I mean? But the, as Dave said, I agree. It bothers me, uh, and it's not our fault, some of our faults. It bothers me when people skip from the 1960s to 2016, 2015, as he said, nothing else had gone on. Within those two weeks that I went to college, at, well, I was, the fall semester I was at Rutgers, as an 18-year-old, I met a, a woman named uh, Lisa Williamson who was two years older than me. She's Sister Soldier. I literally spent the next six years organizing all over the place with Sister Soldier. I was there when she actually took her name Sister Soldier. You know what I mean? And we were doing a, a, a incredible work. When I say we, Ras Baraka, who's now the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, April Silver, who's still who's here in Brooklyn doing amazing work. You know, we were connected to people all around the country. And this is before Twitter, Periscope, Snapchat, anything. Mm -hmm. What we had were calling calls and pay phones, and we just made it happen, you know what I'm saying? But we also took very seriously, uh, Brother Dave and everyone else, studying our history. You know what I mean? You cannot be an activist and organizer if you don't take the time to study history and understand the history of movements in this country globally, which is what we did, many of us, and also learning basic organizing skills. I'm not stepping on any toes, but I've been, I was there in Ferguson when Michael Brown got killed. I was in Florida when Trayvon Martin got killed. I've been organizing in a lot of different spaces, and it's striking to me when I can, I can tell the people who are caught up in the cult of personality and the people who actually know how to organize. Being on Twitter does not make you a leader. Having thousands and thousands of followers does not make you a leader. That's not hard to do, you know what I mean? What makes you a leader, man, 
You know, if y'all watch Selma, regardless of what you might think about Selma, the one thing that I walked away from it is that these sisters and brothers were about strategy. Mm-hmm. You know I, I, mean? I like Selma. Which I, was lo- I loved Selma. Okay. I just didn't know if you had it. No, I did. <laughs> okay. But some people had their issues, but I'm looking at it as a, you know, where we are in 2016. If we're talking about a progressive multicultural movement in this country, what, the most important thing you can do if you're serious about change and justice, you need to be prepared. And I feel like a lot of folks are operating on emotion, and we had emotion too. I mean, we were out there saying some wild stuff. Oh, yeah, we were, you know. Sister Soldier, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but we also had, uh, we took seriously um, organizing. And then on top of what Dave said, we all were hip hop heads. And so here we are. It was funny when I saw, if y'all, who saw Straight Outta Compton? So there's a, remember when Ice Cube left NWA? Yeah. Well, guess they kind of alluded to, he came to New York, he worked with Public Enemy. Well, who mm-hmm. was in the studio when Ice Cube was recording his solo album? Kevin Powell and Sister Soldier. Because we heard that Ice Cube is now linking with Public Enemy. We're like, yo, son, that's gangster. Mm-hmm. We're about to link East Coast and West Coast, and little did we know, six years later, Tupac and Biggie would happen, which I think was purposeful, the whole division. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. all I'm going to say. Okay. I, like I was going to say, just left that. Read the book in a couple years. Dangling. Yeah. No, no, no. And we're going <laughs> to ask you about that. You can. I mean, it seems, sort I of. mean, I want to progress to that point, though, because one of the things that happened, of course, is that you were this uh, sort of youth, emblematic, hip hop generation person. And I assume that's part of what attracted the real world to you, um, the real world producers for MTV. And of course, people don't know Kevin Powell was on season one of The Real World. I was. Um, yeah, and, and oh, let me right. just say, Kevin Powell owns the distinction of being the only person who, in real world history who, when he passes away, hopefully in 80 years in your bed, but <laughs> it, it, will, uh, it won't be the first sentence of his obituary that he was on The Real World. So congratulations <laughs> on that for actually building a life. <laughs> And not just being a reality TV, uh, I don't know. That's I can messed say, up. I, it's things I don't want to say, but I, this reality TV culture blows but, my mind. But, but I, you know, it's interesting he says that because um, from age 18 to 24, we went hard. You know, mm-hmm. uh, when I say like, uh, I, man, I barely slept because we were so, we really believed that we were going to change this world. You know, anti-apartheid movement. Uh, those of y'all who are New Yorkers who are over 30, over 40, you know, it was Howard Beach, it was Bensonhurst, yeah. there was mad stuff going on, you know yeah. what I mean? We were in the midst of all of that yeah. work, you know? And um, I was burnt out by 24 from the organizing work, you know? And, you know, for me, and also, as I talk about in the book, I don't, again, I don't want to give it away, but there's a, a split at some point between myself and Soldier, you know? Uh, and I forgive everyone, you know, but I had to tell the story, what happened from my perspective. And, um, I realized at that point, I just want to focus on my writing for a minute, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I literally was writing bios for record labels. I was hustling. I was straight hustling. I was writing for newspapers, for magazines, bios for record labels. The poetry tr- scene was happening in New York at the New York and Poets Cafe. Mm-hmm. You know, shout out to Willie Padermo and Asha Bendeli and Tony Medina. You know, there was Madheads doing, we were doing work. And I was literally at a, 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 at a cafe in Manhattan called, I think it was called Stardust Cafe or something like that in Times Square. And my hair was like, you know what I'm saying? And it's funny to me to see all the hair come back now. All the flat tops have come back, which is like, I can't believe this has come back. You know what I'm saying? And I was with this group from Buffalo, New York, called Joe Public, R&B group. They were a band, you know. uh, And this woman came up to us and she said, "Um, I like you guys. Look, MTV's doing a show. And, you know, we're looking for some folks to be on the show. And the first thing I thought about was, like, man, MTV is mad racist because they, don't, they didn't want to play Michael Jackson's video, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. Because I was like, Ungawa, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Word. And I'm always going to be like that. And then, you know, it's, they, shout out to David Bowie because he, there's a video circling right now from 1983 where he challenged MTV on its racism. Although we should also talk about the fact that there was some ex- interesting sexual politics with David Bowie, not about sexual identity, but about alleged raping of women so we need to and girls which also needs to be talked about at some point because you know we need to tell the truth about people um but i did so that's complicated to me because it okay. I, i'd like to raise this because obviously whether you're talking about david bowie whether you're talking about bill cosby whether you're talking about miles davis these questions come up about how do you separate the art from the artist and should we separate 
the art from the artist. And as an artist, I want to ask you this question. It would be very difficult to find a poet or a musician, particularly in certain eras in this country's history, who led lives that were straight up and down, admirable in the private sense. And I think most of these folks back then didn't even have the sense that their private life would ever be put up to that kind of magnifying glass. And believe me, this is not to excuse the behavior of any of the people I just mentioned at all, but I think it's, it's an important question because pe for people like me, I mean, there have been times where I felt like Miles Davis saved my life tonight, you know? And so then, and that, but that's his music. That's not him sitting on my couch talking to me. And so it's a, how do you, yeah, and should question. we separate the art from well, the artist? This is why this is, your question is tied to the way I decided to write the book. I'm going to go back to Malcolm X. When I read his autobiography, I had never read anything. And I still have not read anything where I've seen a man. I've seen women do it. Women are honest in a different kind of way. But I've never seen a man be that honest and even own his, his issues. You know, I just feel that. Part of the thing that we're talking about is that we need to redefine manhood in this country, on this planet, where it's about, you know, for me, brother, I don't want to separate my private life from, here's Kevin Powell, the activist or writer. You know, what you see is what you get. You know what I mean? Flaws and all. I'm gr grossly imperfect. But I don't want people to, you know, there's people out there, man, we don't even say any names, but these are folks who I'm sure have been here who are speakers. They do these kind of conversations. They saw all this wonderful stuff, and I know their personal lives. It's, 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 it's despicable the things that they do, you know? And I don't want people to say that stuff about me, you know? Uh, and it, it informed the way I wrote this memoir. It's like, you know, it's not because I'm trying to put it out there before anyone else does. I'm like, just be honest about your life, man. You know, be honest about it and evolve, you know? And if you made mistakes in your past, as I talk about in my book, just say, I made these mistakes. You know what I mean? Because when I look, I love Miles Davis's music, you know, but I also know that Miles Davis bragged in his autobiography about battering Cicely Tyson and other women, you know? I love uh, uh, David Ruffin from The Temptations, one of the most incredible voices ever, but look what he did to Tammy Terrell. You know, John Lennon, his first wife, Cynthia Lennon, just died. Look what he did to her. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that, you know, when we talk about Jim Brown, you know, the great, probably the greatest football player ever, you know, I just think that we as men have got to start holding ourselves and each other accountable because most of the situations we're talking about is 95% of the cases we're talking about are the men. And for me, when my mother said to me, which is that voice in my head to this day, don't be like your father, she's saying to me, you've got to figure out how to be a man with a different definition. You know, that's not hurtful to you and it's not hurtful to other people. And you can't continue to go through your whole life, you know, just saying, well, look at me because I'm a man or I'm a black man or I'm this man or that man. How, when are you going to deal with your trauma so it doesn't hurt you and hurt other people? And so, yeah, people can make great, beautiful art, but I would rather see people be great, beautiful human beings. You know what I'm saying? But, but I, I, particularly as a public figure and a cultural critic, how do you navigate something, though, where you see someone like Bill Cosby and you see what he did and you feel someone as someone who's a devout anti-sexist that you're going to speak out about this, yet at the same time reckoning with the fact that it certainly seems like to me that prominent black men and black entertainers are going to get torn down much quicker than white oh, yeah. entertainers oh, yeah. or politicians. And then there's the whole issue of like people will spend weeks about the misdeeds of a celebrity and not say anything about right. the bombing of innocent civilians in the Middle East or yeah. the police killing people. And so it's like, how, how, do you, how do you navigate making it perfectly clear that sexual assault is always wrong, men do need to heal themselves, and at the same time, the priorities of the media often in the name yeah. of like they're standing up to sexism are actually reinforcing oppression. Well, and I wish I could think of her name right Just now. Simple question. No, Sorry. no it's, a, it's a great question. There's a, uh, a white sister who's here based in Brooklyn. She's a brilliant journalist. I believe her first name is Rachel. She wrote a piece about Cosby that you should Google. You should Google uh, maybe in the last six months or so. She, honest, she spoke honestly about white privilege and white racism and how uh, people put Cosby up on a pedestal because of the show, because the show conveniently does not talk about racism. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't. Let's be honest about it. It made white brothers and sisters in the Reagan era of the 1980s feel comfortable. Now, was the show important to black people and still is? Oh, yeah. 
You know, I mean, look at all the things that the Kabi show put out there. Look at all the figures that it put out there. Look at all the history lessons, music lessons, cultural lessons, et cetera. But her point, which I agree with, is that it never really tackled racism. That didn't happen until you had the spinoff with A Different World where Debbie Allen was directing a show about some serious stuff. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because Debbie Allen's a different kind of person. Then you, she, you add to that Cosby's respectability politics of the last 10 years. I was actually at one of those speeches where he went in on black, poor black people. Now, y'all heard me at the beginning of this saying, I come from poverty. So I was offended when this dude started you know, using these stereotypical names for black folks and talking about sagging pants and all this other stuff. And I'm saying to myself, because I, I, I literally grew up with Cosby. This dude comes from Richard Allen Projects in Philadelphia. When I was a kid, I watched Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, which was a cartoon. Well, where was the cartoon set? In the hood. And then the three movies that he did with Sidney Poitier in the 1970s, mm -hmm. where were they set? In, in the, the hood. hood. And so I'm saying, how does this, you know, and so I think that it's not an either or, it's both. We should say that racism is alive and well, and over and over again, black people, especially black men, become the poster children for bad behavior in this country more than anyone else because of the racism of the mainstream media. Say it very clearly. You know what I mean? As if white men or Latino men or Asian men or other men don't do anything, and we know that all of us do destructive behavior, engage in destructive behavior. But we also need to say, hey, this behavior is not, is, you need to be accountable for this behavior because you're doing damage to a whole community. And Bill was so selfish with that destructive behavior, the 55 plus women, number one, all those people in the Cosby show who will now be, not be getting any residuals, any royalty checks because that show is put on, is frozen, you don't know when that's ever going to happen again. And then his wife is going to be dragged into court sooner or later. You know what I'm saying? And so I th it's not an either or for me. I think we, ha we have to have the mm -hmm. conversation from different angles. But I also believe uh, that we've got to stop putting people on pedestals, stop worshiping celebrities. You know, when you talked about dropping bombs on people, that is a sickness of power where you, people think they could, violence is a solution for anything, but there's also a sickness of power when people are celebrities because of whatever sports or entertainment or whatever it is, and they abuse that power over and over again to the detriment of the people around them. And I just, I just think that what we really need is what Dr. King talked about, a radical revolution of values. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what we really need. That's not, that's not my words, that's Dr. King's words. A radical revolution of values. He said at the end of his life that America needed to be born again. You know, and not in a Christian sense, but look at the, the sickness of our society from Cosby to mass shootings, you know, to the, the ridiculous uh, uh, body language of those Republicans when Barack was giving his State of the Union address the other day as if he was the devil reincarnated. It says to me there's so much ugliness out there you know what I mean? So much ugliness out there. And I, I don't, you know, I just, and so I do think that we have to become, this is why we need to be prepared, brother, whether you're a writer or a speaker, whatever you are, y'all, we need to know history, current events, technology, social media. We need to understand the systems of oppression, racism, sexism, classism, all of it. And we need to become, become be able to articulate this stuff because what ultimately bothers me, Brother Dave, is when I talk with people from Canada or Europe or Africa or the Caribbean or Asia, they know more about our history and current events than we do and can articulate what's going on and what needs to happen better than we do because we don't even realize how we've mm. been so brutally dumbed down mm. in our society. And that should be unacceptable to us. Given, I mean, Deborah Schwartz laid out all the genius that's inside the Brooklyn Historical Society, but how many of us actually come here on a regular basis to take in mm. all this knowledge? And, and that brings us full circle before I open it up to the crowd about why I thought the title of your book is so beautiful. And you don't really understand the title until you read the book. Because I don't know about folks here, but when I saw the education of Kevin Powell, my first thoughts in my head were, okay, Kevin's a hip hop head. Uh, this is a reference to miseducation of Lauren Hill. It was. Or maybe it's a reference to the miseducation of the Negro, Carter G. Woodson. Or maybe it's a reference to the education of Sonny Carson. Brooklyn, son. Yeah, or, or maybe it's a reference to the education of Henry Adams. That too. Which came out it was all of 100 it. years ago. It was. All these things. But then when you read the book, it's not so much about the education of living a life of hard knocks or experiencing oppression or, or doling out pain and understanding how to forgive yourself. It's the education of fiercely holding on to education yeah. itself. 
yeah. as a kind of compass to get through all yeah. of these pitfalls yeah. that existed throughout your life. And that's why I said at the beginning about why I give this book as a present, because it, it, it's Thank about you. the salvation of education. And that's really the one thing we have control over. Of all the things we don't have control over in this world, one thing we have control over is the ability to pick up a book or download somebody, do a speech, or having a conversation with somebody who's an elder and just gaining education. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's beautiful about it. And thank you for writing it. And with that, I really do want to open it up to the crowd. But first, round of applause for Kevin Powell. Thank you. If you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. And so, and I'm, I'm happy to take hands. And it, oh, the only thing, oh, we got a mic from KT. And the only thing I ask, because we don't all know each other here, as New York's blankets just went by, um, if people could say their names before <laughs> they ask funny. the question so we could get to know each other a little bit. That's all I ask. Thank you so much for this. My name is Joycelyn Valentine. Hey, Ms. Valentine. And I'm a registered dietitian. Wow. And I say that proudly because some of our people, when you tell them to eat right, it's, it's expensive to eat healthy, they right. will say. But they have every um, material thing um, around. But I want to say to you, self-love, even for Bill Cosby or these men, we have to, just like you are healing, most people don't get that healing. That's right. And um, we have to look at what's in their background. Yeah. What was in the background? And I wanted to also say that you have made all these runs for political scene. Two. Two. And I'm done for I life. I think you should be. I think. No. I think. No. No, 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 no. I, I, no, I agree with you because you have, God has a plan for you. I That's was not the listening. Plan, no, 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 no. I was listening to NPR. Yes, ma'am. And they featured Tiffany. Anderson, okay. a superintendent in St. Louis, Missouri, African American. Yeah. Yeah. That's changing the mm -hmm. thing. So her kids are hungry. She now distributes 8,000 pounds of food. Mm -hmm. So her kids are homeless. She now has a shelter. And I was just thinking, because my son is in the music field, he said, that's Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think about a hand in the back. Um, and oh, and this is not at all a comment on Ms. Valentine or the coming speaker, but I'm going to ask folks to keep comments to about two minutes, only so as many people as possible have the chance to speak. And so if you hear a little tap, it's just me saying wrap up. Hi, my name is Kepler Biko August. Um, it's nice to meet you all. I, I have a curiosity about uh, synchronicity and um, how we all connect to uh, this uh, planet. Um, do you at all feel that? One of the key words, obviously, that you used was accountability, that we don't all hold that accountability for how we connect to each other and how we benefit off of uh, this system uh, of white supremacy and of ignorance um, to an extent. Do you feel like we, as a race of uh, human beings, lack that, lack that accountability for how we connect to each other? Uh, into nature and to this, whatever this is. Um, wow, great question. You know, the sister uh, before you talked about self-love and the only way I can answer it, because I'm just a simple dude from the hood, man. I'm just a simple dude from the hood. Um, I am. Um, to me, self-love and education go hand in hand, you know, and, and uh, I don't think you're going to be accountable. I don't think you're going to be able to talk about these intersections that Dave was alluding to. If you're not practicing self-love and learning about yourself, your own history, and also learning about other people who might be different than you, beginning to see how we are interconnected. When I say sisters and brothers, and I got this from so Sonia Sanchez, one of my sheroes, you know, many years ago, I noticed that she would say, my Jewish sisters and brothers, or my black sisters and brothers, or my Filipino sisters and brothers. And I was like, why is she saying sisters and brothers? So I asked her, she said, because we're all sisters and brothers, and we need to embody that, you know? We mm -hmm. need to say that. And so I just, I just um, for me, brother, uh, this has been an evolutionary process. You know, I'm still a work in progress, but what started as just focus on race, 
when I was in college, which was a necessary part of the journey. And I'm always going to talk about racism, you know, always. But I began to realize I've got to talk about these other things as well. And, and, and you know, um, uh, when I was saying, you know, no to political office, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, regardless of what you think of Bernie Sanders, listen to what he's saying. The nation just endorsed him today. Listen to what he's saying. You know, he's talking really about that synchronicity that you just mentioned, which is how are we supposed to even go forward where all this money is put into politics and this, a certain, the 1% has all this wealth and then the rest of us are just out there struggling. There's not going to be any synchronicity if we don't become organized, 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 and educated, become prepared to what Sonia Sanchez said, resist, resist, resist. And that's, that's the synchronicity that I want to see, the way the right wing is organized. Like every time I'm on Fox News Channel, literally the moment it goes off, I get bombarded with hateful tweets from right wingers. You know, we who call ourselves progressives, you know, we're philosophical, you know, we're vegans like me, you know what I'm saying? And we do all this stuff, but I want to see a movement. And it can't be putting one person up on a pedestal as a leader, as a speaker, as the grand poobah. No, we need as many people as possible to be going towards that synchronicity and that self love that you both just talked about. Very well said. Um, just very briefly to, to respond to that as well, uh, Sonia Sanchez, I believe it's Sonia Sanchez, also has, has this great line. It, it dovetails with what you said, Kevin, that she said, uh, solidarity is the most highly evolved form of politics. And so if you're talking about like how do we make people accountable, yeah. one of the ways that I've found is you have to make people feel like they're part of the solution and not part of the problem. That's right. So it's like I go to my... Jewish sisters and brothers, and I don't say you're part of the problem with regards to what's happening to Palestinians. I say you can be part of the solution right. if you're one of the folks who stands up and just mark it down the line, saying to white people, oh, you don't like racism? Well, it's not that you're part of the problem because you're white. You can be part of the solution because right. you can be that white person who says racism's not acceptable. You can be that man who says violence against women exactly. is not acceptable. Then you're part of the solution and not part of the problem. So it becomes a question of what what kind of world do you actually want to live in? That's right. One with all of the petty hatreds that I thought Kevin described so well in terms of those screwed up faces at that State of the Union address. Yeah. It's like, do, is that really the world where we want to live in? And I think if we talk to people about how they can be part of that solution, then I think we're at least on, facing in the right direction to the kind of world worth fighting for. Yeah. And, and if I... No. Oh, yeah. I don't expect everyone to agree with everything I say, you know, um, but I'm going to say it because it's important. You know, um, it, it hurts me when I see so-called progressive people who are racist or sexist or homophobic or something else that is hurtful to someone else that's marginalized. You know what I mean? It, 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 you, you, we need to really look in the mirror here, you know, who we are, because it just it just. You know, I've had people say to me, I'm a heterosexual black man. Kev, leave that gay stuff alone. I'm like, okay, so I should not love Audre Lorde. I should not love James Baldwin. I should not love anyone who's contributed to our history. You know what I mean? I should act like these people don't even exist. You know, mm -hmm. and, and Ras Baraka, who I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, his sister Shawnee, his youngest sister and her partner were killed by the husband of the oldest sister. And this husband was an activist in the community because he hated women and he hated them for being lesbians. And I was at the funeral, and it was the saddest funeral that I've ever been to in my life. And you talk about synchronicity, you talk about love in our community. I'm like, you know, these women weren't doing anything to anybody, you know what I mean? But their lives were just taken arbitrarily. And so we've got to make an effort, as Bobby Kennedy would say, you know, to practice love, y'all. You know what I mean? Dr. King talked about a beloved community at the end of his life, but what does that look like for us? You know, we know what we're against. I, you know, progressive people know what we're against. But I always ask the question now, like he said solution, but well, what are you for? Mm -hmm. What are you for? Exactly. Hey. Kevin, how are you? Hey, Jersey in the building. Hey, very good. I, I'm Ricardo Colasar. I came from Jersey City. See my two favorite writers. Wow. And Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so much. Me. And I, I bring up the question since I am, first of all, uh, as you, Dave, you're a sports writer, and as someone, Kevin, who is a big sports fan. Um, Huge. Yes, and myself included. And I want to ask um, for both of you, I guess, uh, the athlete in your lives who influenced you to become writers or influenced wow. you in your writing. Because, you know, like I said, we all want to be, we look at athletes and we all want to be like them. Mm. Why we couldn't, uh, you know, become 
a guy who can dunk or things mm -hmm. like that, but also, you know, for many of these people, and you've got a chance to meet them more than I have, are incredible thinkers and people who, you know, when you do sit down and think about them, you know, they influence how you write, mm. what you think about in terms of any subject. So I just wanted to know from both of you. That's a great question. Oh, man. I mean, obviously, for me, it's Tom Brady. No, I'm just kidding. Ah. Um, <laughs> Yo, you in New joke. York, son. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. You know, but uh, <laughs> no, Tom Brady just said in an interview that he'd never drank coffee in his life. And that's when I was just like, all right, I'm done with get, just, just no more. Shh. That's and even it, worse than supporting Trump. And he supports Donald Trump, right? Yeah, exactly. So, no, I'll just say very, <laughs> very straight up. Like, I, I grew up in New York City. I grew up playing sports. I was the starting center for my high school basketball team. <laughs> We, well, that shouldn't elicit laughter, but it does. Um, now, I'm 5'10", so it was, uh, it was a long road. But it, it was all, but even though I was terrible, like it all just flowed from this love of sports. And for me, that love was never independent from politics. So I was 11 reading like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's autobiography, Giant Steps. And it's where I first learned what Islam was. It's where I first learned what jazz was. Yeah. It's where, I mean, so much came from hearing from Kareem's life. So, I mean, for me, it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who I, I got to interview last week, and it's mm. free if people, I, we sat down face-to-face -face for an hour. Uh, if people just go to edgeofsportspodcast.com, check it out, it's free. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Just listen to it, because it's crazy. Because it's like, I had questions like 30 years I've been waiting to ask him this stuff, wow. and I still had my old autobiography, Giant Steps, from when I was 11. It was, yeah, and it's like dog, I dropped it in the tub a bunch of times, so it was like this mess, <laughs> like this, that I'm, I'm, I handed to him, and it still had my name in it from like sixth grade in like old cursive, and it said like David Zirin 6F, because my teacher was Mr. Flanagan, and I'm like, <laughs> and I asked him to sign it, and all he signed was, uh, hope you enjoy what's left of this book, is what he wrote, and I was, I was just like, man, Kareem, I certainly enjoy what's left of you, Kareem, because you're doing amazing work yeah, to this day. That's right. So that's it for me. I mean, uh, Kareem. It, it's interesting. Um, the first sport I fell in love with as a child was baseball. I love baseball. I'm a huge, lifelong New York Yankees fan, you know. And the first book, one, one Yankee fan? Okay. <laughs> the first book that I, uh, the first writer I fell in love with was Hemingway. When I read For Whom the Bell mm -hmm. Tolls, I was about 11 years old. I talk about it in the book. What I don't talk about is the impact that The Old Man in the Sea had on yep. him. The especially Dimaggio. the Fisher's re, uh, 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 fascination with Joe DiMaggio. Yeah. You know what I mean? And as a kid, I would actually read like Red Barber and some of these great sports writers, you know, and um, I thought they were as colorful as the fiction writers, you mm -hmm. know? I don't even talk about that in the book, yeah. I realized. Uh, sports writers had a big impact on me. You know, I think about it. Uh, I, I, you know, um, or even writers like you know the late Norman Mailer, how he'd write about Ali. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, Ali had an impact. You know, because everyone was writing about Ali. Um, you know, um, I'd say James Baldwin's writings on Sonny Liston yeah. or Richard Wright's writing on Joe Lewis. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're in a time now of hyper segregation when it comes to you either write about sports or you write about politics or yeah. you write about. And it's like it, there is this history, though, in this tradition That's right. of people who really had were gifted with the written word turning to sports as a place to ply their trade. What was the, the late uh, brother from the Paris Review? Um, George Plimpton, George Plimpton, yeah. Great writer. Yeah. Paper Lion. That's right, that's right. Classic. There was, uh, her hand was up in the, in the back, I want to make sure. And then you in the front, of course. Time for everybody. Well, it's not my plane, it's easy for me to say. And let me apologize for having to split. I have to speak at a youth summit in Atlanta for about 300, ki uh, Miami for 300 kids in the morning, so that's why I got to get on this plane tonight. So I apologize for having to leave. I have to start my question by putting my coat on. Yankees, no doubt. <laughs> um, but my name is Jenny. Uh, I'm in my sixth year teaching in the Bronx. I'm born and raised in the Bronx. BX. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And this year, more so than other years, I'm increasingly frustrated with the curriculum, with all the testing that they need, yeah. knowing that they face all this systemic inequity yeah. because they're born as children in the South Bronx. Um, and most of my ninth graders, the class average is a third grade reading level. And knowing how important wow. education is for them to advance in life, what do you suggest to continue to combat an uh, educational inequity? 
Well, you know, first, uh, Dave or Deborah mentioned BK Nation, our organization. Uh, please, in about a week, we should have up on bknation.org an education forum podcast that we did last week with that very, it was called Education Standardized Testing. Uh, Dr. Mark Nason uh, and many other folks were there uh, speaking about these things and, and practical solutions. And bknation.org, BK Nation has an education project. We're about to reboot that thing. So I wanna encourage folks, if you're an educator or, or a parent or a student, to please, uh, Kevin at KevinPowell.net, that's my email, Kevin at KevinPowell.net. We'd love to have y'all as New Yorkers be a part of that because we feel like there's gotta be a coalition of folks. It is uh, difficult, you know, when I see what's going on. Um, I know folks who are great teachers. I know people who have been frustrated and they've quit the DOA. You know what I mean? I know teachers who, many, most of my friends who are teachers have had to buy their own supplies on a regular basis. Uh, I know teachers who are being forced to focus on these standardized tests and they can't even do anything with the curriculum. And then when you look at the curriculum, is it even reflective of these Latino, black, young people, poor people, poor, young, poor financially but not poor intellectually, you know, students in the South Bronx or East New York or Brooklyn or where have you. Um, I feel you have to, we need y'all there. You know, you've got to fight as much as possible to, to introduce something to these kids that let them know that their education matters. One thing that was said last week, that education should be interactive. You know, I was an A student growing up because my mama did not tolerate bad grades. But when I think about it, I was an A student because I memorized stuff and I gave it back very well to the teacher. You know what I mean? That's not really an education. You know, and to me, these kids, a lot of times when I ask kids, how many of y'all love to read, they, they sigh. And then what ends up coming out when you let them speak, and I'm going to do this tomorrow in Miami, if it was interesting, which means if I saw myself in that book, in that text, you know what I mean, then I could probably relate to it. This is why people like Dave Zarin are important, because what are young people interested in? Hip-hop, sports, popular culture, and then you have someone who can speak their language. This is the stuff that's used in, in curriculum, and this is what we should be using. Mm. I'll say it very, very briefly. It's a small thing, but I hope it helps, and I say it because uh, my... My partner, she teaches at DC Public Schools, mm. high school history teacher. Um, th there is uh, a fantastic blog uh, called, I believe it's called I Am an Educator or I Am a Teacher. If you search Jesse Hagopian blog, which is it? Yeah. I Am an Educator. It's, and it's a play on I Am a Man, the slogan from the 68 Memphis yeah. Yeah. strike. So it's full circle here. But one of the things that Jesse writes about a great deal is how to navigate the whole issue with yeah. standardized testing yeah. to actually reach students yeah. and so at the very least Jesse has like amazing tips great. about just how to reach how to reach kids I mean he's at a big public high school in Seattle um, it's not the South Bronx I know I've been to Seattle but but at the same time I mean there is something universal about trying to reach kids so right. I, I hope that's at least marginally helpful that's a good resource thank you and yes please yes thank you uh, so this is a good segue because I'm a, an author. Oh, name young, please. Oh, Dream. I'm an author of young adult fiction. And oh, I cool. want to write, thank you. That's I want to write cool. about hip hop. And I wanted to know, do you think there's a chance for mainstream hip hop to go positive? Like Zulu Nation, De La Soul. Do you think there's ever a chance for it to go back? Um, yeah, I got hope. I do. I have eternal hope. You know, I got hope in... Kendrick Lamar, Lupe, you know, J. Cole, different people like that. Um, you know, this is a whole nother conversation, but let me, there's hip hop culture, which is what I am a part of, then there's hip hop, the industry. The culture, DJ, MC, graffiti writing, B-boys, B-girls, fifth element of hip hop culture, Africa Bimbada said, knowledge, five elements, right? The culture was co corrupted by this industry. You know, we were talking about the late 80s, early 1990s, and how hip hop was a part of the activism. Well, guess what? That hip hop activism scared a lot of people because you had Public Enemy, you had KRS One and Boogie Down Productions, you had Queen Latifah, MC Light. Even when you look at NWA, which is a very important group, their first album is tremendously important, even if it's just for one song. F the Police is still the most important anti police brutality song ever made in pop culture and hip hop history. That's a tremendously important song. You know what I mean? And, but I believe that when hip hop started to go beyond the African American, West Indian, and Latino brothers and sisters who created this culture, and it started to reach Asian and especially white young people, that's when some people were like, oh, heck no. 
Do, go Google an album called Home Invasion by Ice T in the early 1990s. The cover is a drawing of a white brother with headphones on listening to hip hop. Because mm -hmm. Ice T understood what was going on. Why did this happen? Because MTV created Yo MTV Raps late 80s, BT's Rap City. All of a sudden, you know, people are going all over the place. Just like jazz, which he was talking about, it may have started in a certain place, New Orleans, but it began to go around the country and around the world. And so it's reaching people in different ways. And when you look at hip hop over the last 20 years, cult, the industry, the number one how album most years has had a few basic things in common. Overuse of the N-word, a reckless disregard and disrespect for women, excessive materialism, drugs, alcohol, violence, as if nothing else is going on in the hood. Now, those of us really from the ghetto, we know that there's all kinds of stuff going on. Every day ain't just may hit madness and mayhem. But if you also read and study and know about the history of the minstrel show, where black people were depicted as over-sexualized, violent, dangerous, and immoral, and then you look at how we're depicted in the hip-hop industry stuff that's pushed out there, over-sexualized, violent, dangerous, and immoral, is that a coincidence? And then I go, I just came back from the Caribbean, I'm not gonna say the name of the country, but I've been to this country more than any other country in the West Indies, I was struck by how many of the kids have been so Americanized by the stuff that they've been watching and listening to that's now has filtered into their airwaves. And so I say this to say, and people say, well, Kevin, are you being conspiratorial? No, I'm actually being a student of history and of reality, which is what better way to control and destroy a culture than redirect it from love and positivity and light towards death and darkness. Mm. And if you don't know your history, if you don't know the stuff that Debbie Schwartz was talking about, which is inside of this historical society, then you're gonna believe that you're nothing more than N-I-G-G-A's and thoughts and B-I-T-C-H's. You know what I mean? You'll make peace with, what did Baldwin say in the fire next time? You'll begin to make peace with mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And so I do have hope because I think Kendrick represents that. You know, I think some of them represent that, but what we need in hip hop, as well as anywhere else, is a mass movement of artists saying, I wanna, we need to go in a different direction. This is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's a great answer. I'll just say very, very briefly, Two things. One, um, Boots Riley, uh, who's the lead singer of The Coup, cool. uh, his he has a book out that's right now called "Tell Homeland Security We Are the Bomb," and um, <laughs> and he he raises this very the very question you're asking and yeah. takes it on politically, culturally, and I really recommend reading that. The second thing is, and I I, I can't believe I would have said this even two weeks ago, but I, I'm, I'm I have a lot of hope because of the of, the, of Hamilton. And yeah. I never, I just want to be really clear about this, is that I, I prejudged Hamilton before hearing note one. Because uh -huh. I was like, Broadway, hip hop, trying to whitewash the founding fathers. Notice I said whitewash the founding, <laughs> like I was like, I was like Sister Soldier about Hamilton. I was like, this is ridiculous. But then I heard it. Yeah. And it's, um, it's amazing musically. And I mentioned, I said to my wife, she teaches history, I was like, have you heard this? And she goes, yeah, I use it in my lesson plans all the time. The kids love it. And, and then I found out that Hamilton was produced by Black Thought and Quest Love, so it wouldn't sound like Broadway's version of hip hop, it actually right. sound like hip hop. That's right. And, just, and the rhymes, the flows, the references, it is, yes, it's like $1,000 a ticket, but, it, and so it's like, it's ridiculous and absurd, but at the same time, the actual musical content of it actually gives me hope for hip hop's future like few things. And his point, let's find and share the spaces where hip hop exists that need to be put out there. Martha Diaz and all the work she's been doing around hip hop and education for several years. There's so many things, and again, you got my email, I'm willing to share information that I have. But I think, you know, young adult books, uh, just say this, there's not a lot of books about hip hop for young adults, and that needs to happen. Word, do it. Oh, yeah, I wanted to end with that point, please write. Yeah, please. Please. And, and that's, that's something that's told me that once. I said, like, how do you be a writer? He said, first thing you got to know is that writers write. Writers don't talk about writing. They writers write. write. It's hard. And it's hard. But it's the only thing that makes you a writer. And that's the great thing about being a writer is you don't need some special degree. You don't need some sanction from somebody with a corner office. All you have to do, and it's very frightening, and a sports writer, Red Smith, said this. It's his line. He said, mm. all you got to do is open a vein and bleed. Yeah and then you're writing. Yeah. So we, we do have five more minutes. Is there any um, And any writing four questions more since he hit that? Any writing questions? Hey. Hi, my name is Gail. 
Uh, I don't have a writing question. That's all right. But um, you said before, thank God for yoga and therapy. Yeah. Um, I'm a psychologist. I also work in a awesome. school. So I was happy to hear, and I've heard you speak before about your experience with therapy in the healing. Life-saving. And I wondered if you could just speak to um, your process or in your evolution or what point did you feel like you were able to know about accessing therapy? I feel like particularly in the black community, particularly with black men, yeah. um, there's not a lot of talk about therapy. I don't hear, even though people may be in therapy, I rarely in public hear someone say, and I make a point to say to people, yeah, I have therapy appointment tomorrow, just so they can see someone who looks like them who is accessing therapy and it's not what's often, you know, for white people or for right. wealthy people or, or whatever, so that, I think we need to model behaviors. You're saying it. You're answering the question. We need to model what we need to see out there. You know, when I was running for Congress, um, and I don't judge anyone, but it, it, what, beyond the shenanigans of politics, spiritual shenanigans, just to see the unhealthiness in the communities that I was going through, you know, food unhealthiness, uh, food deserts, uh, the pain and trauma out there. Mm. I don't judge people who smoke cigarettes, who smoke weed, who drink 40s, because I've done it all in my lifetime. Trust me. Um, but there's a reason why I'm a vegan now and I drink water and it's good, you know what I'm saying? And, and the reason why I believe in saying I go to counseling, it's the reason why myself and Diallo Shabazz from 100 Black Men in New York are starting next week monthly black male sessions, one month in Brooklyn, one month in Harlem for the black males out there, no matter what your background, no matter what your age, because we're like, brothers, let's create some spaces where we can actually talk about some stuff that's going on in our communities, you know, some safe spaces, you know? And I know there's other groups that exist and, and I just think that, we gotta make a commitment to healing, you know? It may sound corny yeah. to people, but I'm not, I don't, you know, and even she is grapp she's grappled with her whole life, but the probably the most profound thing Lauren Hill said on the miseducation is how you're gonna win when you're not right within. You know what I mean? Um, and and I, I take that very seriously. And so I'm just like, let's just, man, just be honest about it. This hurts me. And, you know, I don't believe in repressing stuff if something bothers me. And what's shifted for me, you know, he talked about the real world and stuff like that. I'm not that dude while I'm, you know, cursing out people and screaming anymore. Like, you know, I get mad, but it's a different kind of energy now. And I believe in this proactive, this proactive anger and this reactionary anger. And I want to be proactive and turn it into something positive, not be self destructive and destructive or sabotaging toward myself and other people. You know what I mean? Mm. And that, that's actually a, a great note to end on, because, not only because we're out of time, because I really do think the book, above all else, is about honesty, it's about healing, and it's about modeling a certain kind of behavior where you're willing to look in the mirror yeah. and not flinch, and then share what you saw with the rest of the world. So that, well, that takes a lot of courage, and so thank you so much for that, Kevin. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you all. And, um, um, if I can just say this, um, please, please, if you can, reach out to me via email, kevin at kevinpowell.net, kevin at kevinpowell.net. Uh, we're starting the Black Male Sessions next week, but we also have monthly forums for BK Nation. Sisters and brothers of all backgrounds are welcome to that. It's at Judson Memorial Church every month. Uh, we want to keep building with the uh, work we're doing here in New York City. You know what I'm saying? Because we got a lot to do and, and a lot to change, y'all. So let's, let's come mm. together and figure out some progressive ways to do some things, all right? Appreciate y'all. Thank you.